All right, welcome back to the channel, guys. I did not post yesterday, and for a very specific reason, actually, that I wanted to talk about and make today's theme, which was that over the last day and a half, I've been building out my own little Mern app. Well, it's nothing crazy complex, but it's a fully functioning app that does a lot of sales operations for us. I produced more in seven hours of work than I, in the last couple of years, could have produced in probably 12 to you know, months. I mean, even if I knew what I was doing and I know basic um, software development, but it, it's led me down this sort of existential crisis of, okay, if I can build this app, what does it mean for QA? What does it mean for testing? And so today's video, I want to take five minutes with one simple theme to the QA folks of the world, particularly as you evaluate your QA team, which is don't get left behind. The train is leaving and the world is changing very, very fast. So with that, Let's get started. Okay, so like I said in the intro, basically over the last day and a half, two days, I built out a Mern app to handle some of our sales operations. Specifically, we do a lot of cold email and trying to use AI to enrich some of that to help our sales team craft more effective messaging. A lot of it's done manually. And so I was like, hey, I could take a lot of this Playwright scripts. I could build a little app that has an interface for them in a day and a half. I was able to do that. It's nothing crazy, but what it's led to is a couple lessons that I want to say, if your QA team is not doing this very quickly, or if you as a QA person are not doing this very quickly, someone who is capable of doing some of this stuff might come after your job. Now, huge caveat to all of this, your company has to be comfortable with AI integrated with your code, right? So massive caveat in sort of what is effective and efficient and what's not. Specifically, let's talk about that. I'm using an IDE called Cursor. There's a couple other tools out there that are similar. Cursor is basically a tool where it allows a, a variety of different, different ways where it, it's um, interacting with the code and the chat and basically taking actions. And what's been most stunning about Cursor to me is its ability to change multiple files based off of a queue. As I've started to think about as a QA person, what are some of the things that traditionally would have been a huge hassle? I have a list of five things that I want to run through and I'll put those here so you can see them. Today, I'm not going to provide examples of each one. That's going to hopefully be in some future videos. I just wanted to make an intro to this and get people to start to look at some of this stuff. So basically in the last day or so, I've used cursor to add test IDs to front end logic by simply asking it to do that. I can go here and ask they add a test ID to the job card on the job page. It did that, right? I've used it to combine locators into tables by just dropping DOMs and saying combine it. But here's where it starts to become game changing for me because traditionally as a QA person, these are things that were really hard for me. We don't learn whole suites very well. I've tried to look through Playwright Core. It's not my strength to teach myself an app just by looking at code. Being able to have cursors, chat function, teach the code and the different functions, features, and relationships between them has been absolutely mind-blowing in my ability to now understand a complex code base. So the thing that I want to emphasize documenting API requirements based on it, even if you're not using AI to write code, right? Because there's a lot of people who says AI makes garbage code, AI makes garbage code, which is in some case absolutely true. Its ability to take a prompt and teach yourself something based on that prompt is pretty wild. Last one, I've practiced, played around with a little bit of dropping commit messages in and then asking what tests are affected by that. It does that really well. And then the last was wait for response, right? So let's just quickly run through two of these. So let's just reset this. And then let's just say add test IDs to the job details page, right? So this is just more of a broad one. I just want to add test IDs to the job details page. We're going to hit go. It's going to find all the job details page and add test IDs. Maybe that's not insane, but I don't know what QA person has not had to ask a developer to add job details or test details. When a developer says like, add in those yourself. And then a QA person's like, wow, okay. So you're trying to dig through the code, understand the HTML, understand all the different components of it. It's, it's genuinely like just so much 
more effective. Now, it doesn't get it perfect, right? Like it doesn't get anything necessarily absolutely right, but it gets it pretty close. So that's just one use case. Next, let's say I'm writing a test case for the post email endpoint. What are the requirements for the body? So let's just reset. We'll click off that. Let's hit go. It's going to find the post email endpoint. And it's going to give you it, right? Now, you could take it a step further. I know that this isn't perfect because I know that some of these are referentials in the model. So let's do this. Go into the model and tell me which IDs need to come from other data tables. I'm sort of making this up and this language is not great. Just the ability to ask these questions and get answers that are 80%, right? makes us as QA so much more effective. And, and what's really fascinating is you could say, well, why is, couldn't a developer just do this, right? Why can't a developer just do this? And the reality is the developers probably can do this, but there is a large percentage of the developers of the world who hate feeling like they're slowing down to write tests. They just want to code, which is great. And a lot of organizations just want developers to code, which is great. And QA is left there saying, okay, how do we backfill all these tests? And the reality is we used to say one QA to four developers or something like that. That ratio with these tools is going to get blown wide open. Like that ratio, one QA person will be able to maintain and add tests for so many more developers. You still need a very smart human to do this. These tools are not perfect. But if you don't get on board with some of these tools and the ability to do some of these things and like just have it do the work and you're kind of guiding it, I genuinely think your QA team is going to potentially be taken over by the two people out of the five that can do this stuff. Or if you're looking at an organization that has eight or nine QA and you're saying, why are we paying for all of this? I would tell you and turn right around, look at the output. And if they're not producing more and more test automation or they're not able to do some of this stuff, I would start to question it. The world is going in a very, very fast direction towards basically we can do so much more with so much less. So over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to start to show what you know you can do, what to expect from your QA team, but check it out. The world's changing. Hopefully we're all on this for the, the ride that it's going to be. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you want more content, check out workwithloop.com. Leave me comments in the comment section. Happy testing. See ya.